Ladies and gentlemen, here we are again, another session at the Air Freight Farmer Digital Event. And uh, this is a very special session, um, especially for me in any case, because I'm going to introduce somebody now who's going to be addressing the subject matter for this particular panel, which is life at the airport and how airports have altered to deliver the vaccines. And the person I'm talking about is Dimitrios Nares, better known to his friends, colleagues and industry friends as Jimmy. And Jimmy is the Section Chief of Aviation Marketing for the Miami-Dade Aviation Department. Jimmy, it's an absolute pleasure to pass the baton on to you. Good luck, sir. I'm going to be listening in. And uh, if, if at any point I might be able to ask a question myself, I will enjoy to do so because it's, um, it's much, much nicer now being on this side of the fence. So over to you, Jimmy, and good luck. Thank you very much, Chris, for the kind introduction. And thank you also to EVA International Media for organizing the Air Freight uh, Pharma virtual event. And welcome to all who are tuning in for this session today. I have the pleasure of moderating this important and timely panel uh, discussion entitled Life at the Airport, How Airports Have Altered to Deliver the Vaccines, from new organized life stand, uh, stands to on the ramp to new practices that have been adapted to handle the new situation. I'm also very pleased to have a very distinguished group of panelists for delivering, uh, who are responsible for delivering life-saving vaccines. We have with us today representatives of two airlines, a freight forwarder, a ground handler, and a cold chain solutions provider. I would now like to welcome and introduce our panelists we have with us today. First of all, we have uh, Don Harrison, who is the head of Global Key Accounts Airlines at EnviroTainer AB. He is responsible for a global team of account managers who promote and manage EnviroTainer's relationships with the airlines. Don comes to us with 20 plus years experience in the airline and cargo industry. Welcome, Don. We have with us Pablo Rousselan, Managing Director of DHL Aero Expresso, a cargo airline based out of Panama. This business unit operates under DHL Express within the aviation division, serving stations in Latin America and the Caribbean, connecting the region through the Miami hub. We also have Michelle Mosco with Huna Nagel, where she is a director responsible for the pharma and healthcare air freight product in North America, including Puerto Rico. Michelle's responsibilities include risk management, compliance, transportation, GXP competencies, the IATA CEIB Pharma program, and overall operational excellence in the network. She has 20 plus years of freight forwarding experience. Welcome. We also have Christina, Christina Oñate, the Vice President of Marketing and Product Development for Latam Cargo. She is responsible for all functions relating to the company's product development, customer experience, global account sustainability, and brand strategy of the cargo business of Latam Group. She has nine years experience in the cargo business of the airline industry. Finally, welcome to Sean Paul Booth, Vice President Cargo Business Performance North America for Worldwide Flight Services. Now in his 16th year with WFS, Sean Paul is part of the senior leadership team overseeing all of WFS's North American cargo operations and he heads various special projects, including serving as the functional North American lead of WFS's project Coldstream Task Force, formed to coordinate the handling of the global transport of the COVID vaccine. So once again, welcome to all our panelists and thank you for being here. I'd like to first set the tone and uh, have a little background of why we're all here, of course, on this panel discussion. Uh, the COVID pandemic, which began in the latter part of 2019, was an unexpected, unforeseen global event. Approximately 100 years have passed since the last pandemic of this magnitude, so at least in our lifetime, this has been an unprecedented event. Consequently, since most of us did not fathom planning for, for such an event, we were caught largely unprepared to deal with it. Just as practically all organizations, Miami International Airport had to adapt to changes brought about the pandemic over the past 18 months, and we dealt with it on two main fronts. The first pertained to our role as an airport operator in the supply chain. Due to the importance of getting shots in arms rapidly, it was clear to us that air cargo and airports would play a critical role in the COVID vaccine distribution. We knew that multiple COVID vaccines would be in the making and in our extensive air route network distribution hub status and CEIV pharma certified airport community that we have, 
it was incumbent upon us to prepare ourselves and our airport partners for when the vaccines would be developed. So we immediately began to work on vaccine distribution preparedness. We researched the infrastructure, cold storage capabilities, the challenges of vaccine distribution that we anticipated we would face. We convened the MIA VAC-19 task force, an internal task force consisting of various critical areas of our airport operations. Then we met with our cargo community stakeholders, such as airlines, cargo handlers, forwarders, federal agencies, and pharma shippers to address operations, processing, and cool chain management. We then collaborated with airports, communities across the globe through TIACA and pharma.aero on the global effort to develop guidelines and enable, and enable the optimal transport of the vaccine. The second main area for us as an airport was adapting to, to operating in a large and active pandemic scene. As a large airport facility with thousands of air travelers passing through each day, we had to implement safety measures to create a safe environment for our airport users. This became our top priority. We increased standards of cleanliness and sanitization throughout our terminals, increased signage promoting social distancing, encouraging wearing masks and limiting seating density. We installed plexiglass in between check-in counters. We were one of the first airports to install state-of-the-art 3D scanners at TSA checkpoints to reduce physical contact and speed up the check-in process for passengers. We also began a vaccination program at the terminal at MIA where employees as well as travelers could get vaccinated. Our airports operations changed drastically in 2020. We saw passenger numbers plummet, yet our cargo operations grew significantly and we had a record year for cargo volumes at Miami International Airport. We saw the advent of the Prater, where passenger aircraft were solely used for transporting PPE and cargo. We saw increased cargo charter flights. So Miami International Airport, just like the industry as a whole, was affected by and has adapted to the pandemic in many ways. Before we begin talking about vaccine distribution specifically, I want to ask you, the panelists, to briefly explain how your work life in general has been altered by the pandemic. Michelle? Hi, good morning, Jimmy. Good morning to all the panelists, and thank you for the invitation. Um, yes, Kira and Agle adapted, obviously, to the new environment. Um, we did a lot of uh, activities, right? We um, segregated teams from A to B um, to lessen the impact in the offices, reconfigured the workplace, um, implemented health screening, um, contact tracing, and quarantine procedures to, to, you know, to ensure the safety of the employees. Then obviously transition into a full digitalization uh, to allow the transition of working remotely. Also, we secured uh, PPE to keep the critical workforce working in our warehouses and, and gateways. Um, and from a personal perspective, obviously the reduction of business travel and uh, then adapting to the face-to-face -face, uh, over Zoom <laughs> like we are doing right now. Um, and and it, have, it has worked very well. But we are we're looking back to to going back to the to the office, obviously. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle and Pablo. How has uh, your uh, experience been during this pandemic? Well, again, thanks everyone uh, for inviting me and everyone else also for being here. Well, it has changed a lot uh, from sanitizing aircraft, from having and accommodating people from the national health agencies in house checking my pilots for from implementing medical passports for everyone. So if you haven't got to the doctor that week, you couldn't enter the facilities. Up to dealing with all the agencies we didn't even know of on the tarmac just around our aircraft. So it, it, it has been very weird times, but uh, we adapted in addition to everything that Michelle said, of course, we had to do all of that too, in the sense that IT was um, very much the cornerstone for all of us to keep operating. Excellent, thank you, Pablo. And Sean Paul, how has your experience been during this pandemic? Yeah, I think you know, similar to Pablo and Michelle's feedback, um, you know, the the beginning of the pandemic, you know, travel shut down uh, in in our, in our business, you know, covering a large uh, network in North America, you know, that that was a big impact um, for how we operate. You know, transitioning that to to virtual. 
um, offices. You know, that was a big undertaking from our IT folks. And then just uh, essentially rewriting all of our safety manuals um, was as the information came out on how to address the pandemic, you know, in an office setting um, that, you know, not everyone can work from home. So it was, it was a huge challenge in the beginning. I think now, you know, we've got a good grasp of, uh, of what are the right protocols uh, to put in place. Uh, but uh, yeah, definitely a, a rough transition um, early on. Thank you, Sean Paul. Christina, how has work life changed for you during the pandemic? Yes. Hi, hi, everybody. Um, thank you for, for having us here as well. Um, at LATAM Group, our policies, of course, adapted to, to local restrictions. And uh, we even went above requirements to keep our team members safe. Some of the things that we've done have already been mentioned. Uh, so in positions where it was possible, we started working remotely uh, right at the beginning of the pandemic. And we're still working remotely. We're looking forward to going um, to the office back in 2022. Um, for those people in operational roles uh, that uh, um, kept going to the warehouses and the airport, uh, we enforce strict safety protocols, including some of the things that have already been mentioned, right? The social distancing. We work in predefined cells so people don't uh, mix much. They work all the time with the same people so we also can control uh, better um, if someone uh, test positive. Uh, we're in PP at all times. Uh, also, in our in order to offset the loss of of this informal relationship that we used to have, we leverage technology to keep everybody in touch. So we've been um, trying to make the most of Zoom, Teams, uh, Google Hangouts, like every um, platform available. Excellent. Thank you, Christina and Don. How how has work life been for you over the past eighteen months or so? I, I think it's been uh, a challenge, certainly, uh, but a very interesting experience, to be very honest. Um, like everyone else on the panel, we, we've done very similar things from PPE and Zoom and all those things. But the thing I noticed the most was how important customer relationships are. Um, if anyone ever questioned uh, going out and meeting with customers and developing relationships, uh, a pandemic will certainly test those relationships and, and solid, strong relationships make a huge difference um, in how you're able to move forward and, and get through this. And I think we all come out of it better. Excellent. Thank you all. And I think uh, collectively, all your responses, uh, you know, very well captured the new reality, uh, you know, of working uh, under a pandemic. So thank you all for your for your uh, comments. And feedback. Okay, let's uh, begin with some questions re specifically regarding the vaccines. Um, so uh, early on in the pandemic, we heard a lot about what a huge undertaking vaccine distribution would be. We heard the scale would be enormous and that uh, tremendous volumes of vaccines would be transported by air freight. Uh, from your perspectives, can you please tell our audience if the reality fit the perception of the vaccine rollout that was envisioned early on, where the volumes as anticipated, and how did your operations uh, change overall? Uh, I'd like to go to Sean Paul first. Um, I, as I mentioned, and I know he has been involved in a task force early on to deal with the pandemic. So I'd like to hear uh, from you first, Sean Paul, please. Sure, thank you, Jimmy. Um, so, so from the WFS perspective, you know, just like you mentioned, you know, the, the initial white papers, um, you know, from some of the industry experts were saying this was going to be the largest airlift of any single commodity in the history of the world. Um, so, so that was a huge red flag, you, you know, four alarm fire. Um, you know, immediately we created the, the Cold Stream Task Force to, you know, globally address um, from the WFS network you know, how we're going to respond. Um, you know, we, we developed in-house, you know, solutions, you know, working with our carrier customers, forwarders, um, you know, training programs for every single leader, you know, across the network, um, specific to, to pharma handling um, and vaccine handling. And, uh, you know, it, it was it was a really kind of a good collaborative effort. Um, and uh, I, I guess, you know, the, 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 the reality was very much different. It was much more scaled back, uh, right? Most of the vaccines were transported on the integrator networks. Um, didn't go through, um, you know, the, the majority of our gateways. We, we did see some vaccine movements in, in Brussels and in some pockets in North America. 
Um, but for the most part, uh, you know, we, we were we were ready for something that was much bigger than than what finally ended up coming, which, uh, you know, I think was a good exercise for us, you know, going back to, to Don's comment, you know, I think we're definitely better for it. Um, you know, we, we collaborate at the global level, which we don't get to do too often. And, uh, you know, we, we were ready for something much bigger. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it ended up being, uh, you know, not a, 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 an undertaking in itself, but definitely not the volumes or the magnitude that we expected. Okay, interesting. Thank you, Sean Paul. Um, you know, it's difficult to forecast volumes, and I know that Kuna Nagel does quite a bit of modeling. So, uh, uh, you know, for to forecast uh, demand. So, I'd like to go to Michelle next, please, for this question. Yes, thank you, Jamie. So, so from the beginning of the pandemic, uh, Kuna Nagel also created a task force. It was a global task force, and working with the customers and our partners, we ran a model that showed a lot of less volumes that the other companies were showing. Um, some companies uh, understood that it was going to be one dose per vial, and then when you calculated that, it was uh, this this huge volumes, right? But we had additional information showing that each vial will be five uh, to twenty doses, and our model turned out to be right and and correct. So um, so now that that we're you know that we understand the business right and have more information. We see that vaccines are being produced in batches, and each batch is eight to 12 pallets in average, and spend very little time in storage. Therefore, we just uh, are focusing on supporting our customers and just transporting the, the products into the marketplaces and the countries. Um, we also um, created a hypercare team to support the operation, but overall, it just kind of fit into our healthcare network operations. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, Pablo, I, I know that uh, Panama, of course, is a big hub uh, for distributing vaccines, uh, especially for the region. So then I want to I'd like to ask find out from you how the volumes were for you, uh, if they were as expected, if they were different in any way. Yeah, so the, the main constraint for us actually was the CO2 volume, because of course the aircraft cannot handle as much as good, even though the cargo itself can actually by weight do it due to the limitation because there are human beings inside the aircraft, we couldn't do it, right? So that was our model. And uh, we did realize, as Michelle said, that maybe uh, at the very beginning, everyone was overshooting, but we expected because of the very good communication with our clients, to have a more smooth, and, and when I say smooth, is less bulky and more fluid movement of the vaccines. So we're prepared and, and it worked out very well. Uh, we never had any issues with, with those, those, that kind of packaging and the volumes were lower. And when I say the volumes is the packaging itself was smaller. So it, it was funny to see how when we um, took the pallets out of the aircraft and all the cameras were on, with such tiny boxes. But that's, that was what we had to do because that was the volume on, on the pallet and, and, and we were restricted to CO2. Excellent, thank you, Pablo. And, and to hear from our other airline uh, for LATAM, Christina, how was uh, the experience for, for LATAM Cargo? Yeah, so um, when we started preparing for the so-called mission of the century, right, um, we, we focused mainly on two things, the volume and transportation requirements. So in terms of volumes, uh, we experienced something similar to what Michelle said. We, um, we made our own calculations, and those were more conservative than what we were seeing in the press. Uh, fortunately for us, we were not uh, far from what we have actually seen. Um, and in terms of transportation requirements, uh, we already had a pretty robust pharma product. We were the first airline in the Americas uh, to obtain the CID pharma certification. And uh, that together with the significant advances that were made on packaging uh, for those needing extreme temperatures allowed us to transport vaccines with extremely high success rate. What uh, it was indeed different from what we had envisioned, uh, and that has also uh, affected our operation the most, is the level of uncertainty in shipments. So there, there was or there, there is sometimes no um, short-term um, confirmation. 
um, information such as, for instance, the origin or the week of transportation is difficult to plan. Uh, then also like volumes change unexpectedly, delivery dates get moved last minute, and that impacts our itineraries given the high priority of these shipments. Thank you, Christina. Uh, and finally, to, to Don, uh, as, as a um, solutions provider, container solutions provider, uh, how, how was it for you? Did you have enough containers? Um, was, it, uh, was it hard to meet the demand for, for use of your containers? How was the experience for you guys at our retainer? I think initially, uh, during the discussions that we took with, with the market and then with regulatory bodies uh, who began a, a bit of panic, uh, around the volumes. Uh, initially, there was concern, uh, but our modeling was similar to Kuhn and Nagel's in that we, we felt we were comfortable uh, being able to handle the doses uh, that move two to eight, especially, uh, which is actually much more than most people think. Um, and then also all of our other business as well, because remember, we still have to provide pharmaceuticals for the rest of the world for other things. Uh, we transported somewhere in the neighborhood of 500 million doses so far. Uh, in Envirotainer containers together with our partners. Uh, you know, we worked very closely with Christina as well uh, because it wasn't just about transporting the doses themselves, but also the logistics around getting the containers in the right place. Um, and we absolutely couldn't have done that without our partners, uh, you know, working together closely, managing all of those different aspects that she talked about uh, because it became extremely complex, but the communication was critical. And, and that communication made a big difference. Uh, it just goes to show what, what the global logistics system is capable of. It's pretty exciting. Excellent. Thank you, Don. Okay, uh, I'd like to move on to uh, next question. Um, at least uh, for vaccines requiring extreme cold temperature storage, such as minus 70 degrees, some of the concern early on was if the industry could secure adequate quantities of dry ice in order to maintain the extreme temperatures. And again, that was just the perception early on, whether that ended up being reality or not. So the, my question to the panelists is, can you please tell us about your experience, is good or bad, with using dry ice for storing and transporting vaccines? And please also tell us how your experiences have been with the use of packaging solutions for vaccines requiring lower temperatures, uh, such as two to eight degrees. Uh, Pablo, start off with you, please. Thank you, Jimmy. I have to give kudos to the, to the manufacturers, to, to be honest. It was impressive. I don't think there was a single event related to dry ice. I didn't have to repackage a single container. It was all good, smooth, and as we were moving things really fast, it was just great. We, we didn't even have to use cool rooms, so I have no issue whatsoever. Again, kudos to the manufacturers. Excellent. Thank you, Pablo. And uh, Sean Paul, uh, how was it for WFS in terms of uh, the use of, of dry ice and other packaging solutions? Uh, how, how was it for you? How was the experience? Yeah, I mean, so th that was our number one concern, you know, in, in the early planning stages, you know, the deep freeze requirement. Um, there was really no precedent uh, for having such a high profile sensitive commodity with, with that type of, of extreme special handling requirement, right? So, um, you know, the, but going, you know, like Pablo said, the, the manufacturers and shippers did a great job. So once the vaccines did start rolling in, we quickly realized that, you know, the, the packaging of the dry ice uh, was set up in a way that the commodity was essentially handled as general cargo. Um, you know, we needed to have the proper communication. We needed to have the proper um, you know, chain of custody controls, you know, security uh, and, and safety um, protocols. But, but the reality was that this was just a pass through. It was coming in through the building and getting expedited through the process as quickly as possible with really no special handling requirement outside of that. So, I mean, it was, it was really, you know, testament to the planning on the manufacturer and shipper side that, um, you know, for us at the terminals, it was really a, a little to no impact. Thanks, Sean Paul. Now, uh, from an airline perspective, Christina, I remember hearing early on that uh, managing air, aircraft capacity because of the, the use of dry ice uh, could have been a, an issue. So was that an issue for LATAM? 
Um, so it, it has not been an issue. It has been something that we've been working on. Um, yes, uh, I think that the main challenge for us was to to work on the first on the limits established by the by the aircraft type, so we could maximize the amount of dry ice that we could uh, take uh, on each flight. And also the other thing that we've seen uh, lately is uh, a capacity management with other commodities such as live animals. When you're um, transporting the maximum amount of dry ice that you can uh, put on a on an airplane, you have to be careful with the other um, commodities that um, you know are, are sensitive as well. Excellent, thank you, Christina. And Don, uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, not all vaccines require deep freeze, and I know that Envirotainer moves uh, moved, as you said, five hundred million doses, which are pr uh, primarily you know the lower temperature ranges. Uh, so, what was what was your experience uh, with uh, with you know being able to move uh, lower temperature range uh, vaccines? How sure. was that for you? Yeah, I mean, as you guys know, the the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines required that ultra low temperature, right? Uh, but in many cases, uh, that was manufactured in region for in region distribution. So it didn't require air transport in a lot of cases. Uh, some of the other vaccine manufacturers, Sinopharm, Sinovac. AstraZeneca, uh, the Sputnik vaccine, they were two to eight. Um, so I think that was, it's very interesting when you break down the numbers, uh, you know, China distributed, you know, some three and a half billion doses uh, of vaccines, uh, including what they distributed internally uh, in China. Um, you know, and those are back of the envelope numbers. But majority of the vaccines globally seem to move two to eight, uh, especially when air transport was involved. Uh, so it was a big, it was a big job. And, and, and like I said, it couldn't have been done without really close communication. Uh, Pablo mentioned the, the pharmaceutical manufacturers. Um, it was critical to have that level of communication with them uh, in order to manage it effectively. Excellent. Thank you, Don. And thank you all for your answers to that question. Uh, the next question I have for you, uh, the pandemic and the vaccine rollout has definitely tested and challenged the aviation industry, but I also have heard many positive stories about improved cooperation that has resulted. So can you please give us some examples of how the common cause of delivering vaccines safely to the end user has brought about cooperation among your partners? And I'd like to begin with you, please. First, Christina. Thank you, Jimmy. Um, yeah, cooperation has never been better. Um, pharma is always complex, and this was clearly a series of challenges in which failure was not an option. Um, that certainly led to total alignment, and it enhanced cre creativity to find new solutions together, right? So, for instance, we worked together with uh, Envirotainer and Unilow to create two pop-up return stations in Santiago de Chile and in Sao Paulo, Brazil which were implemented in record time and greatly helped the return logistics that Don was referring to right before. Um, this concept enabled us to offer more competitive leases for our countries and at the same time help balance the containers inventory in a timely manner. So it was a great success. Um, another example of cooperation is uh, what we developed with uh, one of our um, interline partners. And this was a unprecedented inter interline SOP specifically for COVID vaccines that enable us to offer more alternatives to our clients. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Michelle, I'll go with you uh, now. Did, with q and Ogle, did you uh, see that you had a new cooperation uh, opportunities with any stakeholders, uh, you know, any partners in the supply chain that you work with? Yes, uh, absolutely. We have worked with all, all of our suppliers, and, and I'm talking about packaging companies and, and carriers, uh, ground handlers, and we have implemented um, all of our processes, lane risk assessments, um, and, and very successfully. And, and the priority right, of the cargo when we're shipping, right? Um, we have even uh, being told that vaccines will have higher capacity than luggage <laughs> in passenger flights. So it's been it's been outstanding the collaboration and the partnerships with with all of our uh, uh, suppliers. And in addition, and, and and in Miami, and this is an example that we worked together, Jimmy. We had that uh, meeting with the U.S. Customs and Border Protection, right, to implement a pre-alert process to ensure that anything transiting through Miami 
the, the documents we review ahead of time to avoid any hold while transiting through Miami into Latin America. And that has been working very, very well. So, so yeah, a lot of examples, right? But um, overall, very, very impressed with the willingness from the, from the industry overall. I mean, we've been around in, in this industry for, for decades, right? And, and this has been um the this is the the proof right that everything that we have discussed over the years we're trying to execute and it has been that way thank you thank you michelle and thank you for including miami international airport as an, in your example of cooperation <laughs> thank you very much appreciate it uh sean paul how was it at wfs uh you know how uh, were you able to have new experiences and with, with cooperating amongst your uh, your partners yeah, I mean, echoing the other panelists' feedback, uh, you know, the collaboration was really complete from, from end to end, right? You know, from, from the expedited customs clearances, um, you know, coordinated immediate deliveries and pickups um, to mitigate the, the dwell time at the facilities, you know, security escorts all the way to the terminal or to the aircraft. I mean, it was, it was every shipment was really handled as an individual um, operation. And uh, you know everyone really obviously understood the importance of the of the proper handling protocols, and, and you know everyone was really flexible to make sure that you know the, the quality of the service was priority one. Um, so you know everyone's kind of own internal um, you know priorities or or you know were, were completely eliminated. Everything was focused on the product um, as as it should be, um, but obviously that's not always the case. So you know, it, was, it was really great, and I think it definitely you know was a good lesson learned on what the potential is uh, when everyone works together. Excellent. Thank you, Sean Paul. Pablo, any examples of uh, cooperation during the, the past 18 months? For sure. It's, it's been incredible. It's definitely a great experience to see how everyone was helping selflessly. I mean, it's from from our, our clients, the airports again, your airport, uh, Jamie, uh, to the customs. So everyone was trying to see how to make processes better in general. So um, I can talk directly for my business unit. So throughout the Americas, what we saw was especially entities that are not used to do this sort of things, um, help out each other. Like for example, customs working with airports and, and airlines, that's not something that we see every single day. And, and it was impressive to, to actually see how this united us a lot, like, like customs, doing new processes in order to expedite the shipping. And, and we could have in five minutes, a van rolling out with everything we had after the aircraft landed. That was impressive. And that was quite a show when all the cameras were on because it was not only the DHL brand that was there, it was everything. I mean, the, the whole country. So more than, more than 27 country really, really knocked it out of the park. And uh, another thing that was really nice, especially also at Miami, it was um, seeing how they help us out to accommodate all our aircraft better in order to have a better logistics and movement around the airport. And, and that state is lesson learned and, and we're going to be enjoying that for the rest of the time. So it's been awesome. Thank you, Pablo. Don. I, I don't think there's a lot to add, but what I'll say is, uh, you know, the the collaboration we received from the regulatory bodies, whether it was customs or health ministries, or even uh, like the likes of the FAA, EASA, uh, I think it's something as logistics folks uh, on this call and, and, and those listening, we need to keep that going. Uh, we saw what it did for the logistics industry uh, across the board during a pandemic. Imagine what it could do for, for every day. Uh, if we keep that interaction alive and that collaboration alive with the regulatory bodies, I, I'd recommend we all uh, collectively uh, have those discussions with, with our contacts uh, just to promote that even more. Thank you all for your comments. Yeah, I, uh, you know, as an airport, I think all airports can, can probably echo the same uh, sentiments, but you're all partners. We're all in on, on this together. Uh, you know, we're just all one piece of a supply chain and working together is how we accomplish things and uh, cooperation definitely went to you know uh, the next level during the pandemic i mean we've always talked about cooperation uh, in the past but we really saw it uh, you know come to fruition and 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 become more of a of a normal part of our operations thank you guys okay uh, so the next question i have for you 
um, is what were some of the challenges you came across with vaccine distribution that you did not anticipate early on? What surprised you? What was uh, uh, you know a challenge that you just uh, uh, didn't anticipate? Uh, and um, Michelle, I'm going to go with you because I know uh, Cuna Nagel has, uh, I think, all of its stations worldwide uh, certified CIV Pharma. So when we're talking about global distribution, uh, you know, I'd like to go to you first. I'm sure you have a very uh, you know, broad a view of, of how um, it has been. Yeah, so so um, so we'd rather not focus on challenges, but rather on solutions, right? Because um, we have moved um, vaccines in the past um, for, you know, yearly campaigns with other with other shippers, right? Um, the biggest difference this uh, this time, right, was the security on the countries, the media frantic. Um, then the need of military or escort services around the globe. Um, and so, so that, that was the biggest difference from, from a Curanago perspective, but we were, you know, uh, working with all of our offices, globally or, uh, or agents um, to ensure what are the requirements locally. And also we, we um, did thorough lane risk assessments because this will uh, help us identify what was truly needed. Was it just, uh, you know, in the U.S., you know, there was there was a uh, um, FBI escorting uh, trucks, right? Um, and and so so similar models were were done to ensure that um, we we comply with those requirements on a local uh, perspective. Um, we we secure also um, capacity with our uh, airline partners to ensure that you know we were able to transport everything we have been asked so far so so no capacity issues to till the day uh luckily and and again we need to be mindful that only a small percentage of the world has been vaccinated so we still have uh a lot of work to do probably in the next two three years and then uh boosters etc right there's countries that haven't been vaccinated like less than one percent so there's still a lot of opportunities ahead and and um and, and, and business that we're going to be handling for the next couple of years. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. And uh, Sean Paul, with your uh, experience in both CEIV and GDP uh, guidelines, um, you know, what have you seen in terms of vaccine distribution? What challenges have you come across that you have not uh, anticipated? I, I think the, you know, the biggest challenge um, for us and, and probably for everybody was just navigating the unknown in the beginning. Um, you know, there was, you know, we have a huge network, um, you know, so some of the first questions were, you know, what, what are the trade lanes going to be, you know, where, where, how, how do we prepare for something if we don't know where it's coming from or where it's going to, right, so, um, you know, that, that, that was a huge challenge, so in, in the beginning, it was very much prep over preparing, preparing to, to be able to handle this everywhere, and then we started, you know, once the distribution started, we started being focused on certain lanes, certain markets, um, and, and that obviously you know, did, you know, made it easier for us to, to ensure that in those markets, we were fully prepared and, and, and capable of, uh, of, of the vaccine distribution. Um, but yeah, you know, the, the just, it, was, it was something that was unprecedented. So in the beginning, um, you know, we, we were learning very quickly um, every day. Uh, so I think, I think that was definitely the, the biggest uh, you know, challenge was, uh, you know, how do we prepare for something that we really don't know what it's gonna look like. Thank you, Sean Paul. Uh, Pablo, was there anything that uh, uh, any any challenge that was also unforeseen as as an airline from an airline perspective? For sure, and I have to agree with what Sean Paul and Michelle said. Of course, in terms of planning, we planned a lot, but I definitely didn't anticipate all the security protocols related. I didn't even know that we'll be talking to special forces, police, intelligence agencies, armies to accommodate a lot of things. It was was not easy to handle around my aircraft um, generals that wanted to get to the vaccine pallet directly and, and explaining to them and to the media that it just couldn't run towards an engine that has um, had not been shut down yet because these people are not used to be around aircraft. So a lot of training had to be done, a lot of communication. Um, they understood very well. We used a couple of examples. Um, and videos to see why it was risky. Uh, nevertheless, in a couple of countries, we, we did have to just raise a hand and, and tell someone like, please don't move towards the aircraft. It's not related to vaccine, it's to you. 
So um, that was for me the, the toughest one. Even even people with cameras trying to move around an aircraft. Um, it, it's very interesting how for us it's normal, it's everyday life. But uh, when you see people that don't know how to handle around one of those large buddies, uh, it, it's quite risky. It's an industrial environment. And, and for us, that was the biggest challenge. The rest was a lot of planning. And as Sean Paul said, lots of modeling, lots of revisiting, but, but that's part of our job. But we did not foresee, again, I, I couldn't even foresee at all how it will be on, on first name basis with generals. Like I've never done that in my life. Completely, uh, you know, uh, unexpected, um, just something, it, part of our new reality that we just, we never anticipated before. Uh, thank you, Pablo. Uh, Christina, also from, an, uh, from another airline perspective, was there anything unpredictable or, uh, you know, unexpected in terms of the vaccine distribution? So, so what we lived is very similar to what has already been mentioned. I have to agree with Jean Paul that the uh, uncertainty of information was, I think, the the uh, biggest challenge for us. We did not anticipate that. We did not have that for PPE, and it was it was difficult not to know which origins for this each destinations because it depended on you know government purchases, uh, dates of delivery, temperature requirements. We didn't know exactly which uh, vaccines they would be buying and which packaging they will be. Uh, using quantities. Um, so this significantly stress our operations and sometimes put us at risk of losing capacity that could have been used in other lanes. So I would say uncertainty of information for us was the biggest challenge. Thank you, Christina. And finally, Don, uh, you know, you, you've touched on uh, your experience uh, with Asia and China specifically with, uh, you know, various vaccines. Uh, do you have any uh, different perspective or, or do you share any of the uh, of the, any of the challenges that were mentioned uh, by the other panelists, please. I, I think I share all their perspectives, but one thing that I think jumped out to us as, a, as an extreme challenge very initially uh, during the pandemic uh, was the sudden and severe reduction in air capacity as passengers stopped traveling around the world. Um, you know, there was a period of time, a few months, uh, where we were wondering how are we going to move all of these vaccines around the world? Uh, without aircraft. Uh, fortunately, uh, you know, as, as logistics professionals do, we found a way, passenger freighters, uh, you know, adding capacity wherever it was necessary, uh, you know, but that was an extreme concern uh, for us and for, I think, for everyone, just losing that air capacity, especially in APAC, uh, where they were hit very, very hard. Thank you, Don, and thank you all for answering that question. I just have one final question. Uh, and as many of us do on these uh, panel discussions and webinars, our final question is usually uh, looking forward, looking ahead. <laughs> so, um, you know, many things, as some of you mentioned, as some of you mentioned, many things have slowed down a bit uh, for certain countries, but the demand for vaccines in Africa and a number of uh, countries in Latin America, for example, is still growing. Uh, and soon we will also be dealing with the rollout of uh, vaccine booster shots all around the world. So, uh, you know, the, the, our work is going to continue. Uh, so I wanted to ask, are there any lessons learned over the past 18 months that we can use in the coming year? Uh, and what can we expect in the future? Uh, and Don, I'd like to begin with you, please, first. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, communication is absolutely critical. And if it wasn't thought about before, it needs to be thought about now. Um, I think we've all talked about the collaboration and communication, especially with those who we didn't normally communicate with. Uh, and you find that that creates success. So I think we need to continue that, that approach. We need to continue that pressure on all of our partners to, to maintain the communication. And if, if people question why, we just point back uh, to history. History is a good teacher. Excellent. Well, well said, Don. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And Christina, uh, please, any, anything that we learned uh, over the past 18 months that we can take forward with us? Definitely a lot. We've learned a lot. Uh, but uh, we did see some um, key takeaways from the COVID vaccine conversation. So the, the main ones I would say it's um, first, the value of a deep and well-researched analysis, including sharing information along the supply chain, what we've been talking about here, the um, cooperation 
Um, I think that way we can all be properly prepared without over investing, uh, which is something we I think we are all uh, interested in doing. Then uh, what Don was uh, referring to the these new communications channels that we've opened uh, and that have benefit us all. Uh, we, be we believe this level of transparency and coordination is something that as an industry, we should continue developing in the future. And uh, thirdly, um, we've seen the social value of the air cargo. I think uh, as an industry, we've played a crucial role in the distribution of the vaccines in a, in a fast, reliably way around the world. And um, I think this is something we, we have to to think about and, and to um, take as a, as a learning point. In our case, uh, we also decided to support our home markets by giving local governments access to our domestic network for free through our solidarity plane. And through this program, which is a social uh, responsibility program, we have currently transported more than 140 million doses in South America. Uh, excellent. Thank you, Christina. Thank you. Uh, Michelle, any any um, any lessons learned for you? Yes, uh, I think from a current perspective, you know, in retrospect on the last 18 months, uh, I think the most exciting thing was that uh, the manufacturers were coming to us to create solutions together. And um, and and this has been the, the success factor for us that we have worked jointly with the manufacturers, with all the stakeholders, with the airlines, with the packaging providers, and, and, and work together to provide a solution. And um, obviously the communication, collaboration, like my other uh, industry peers have mentioned here. Um, and, and also it's exciting because there is still so much more. Um, like I said, we're barely starting with vaccines. There's gonna be boosters, there's gonna be therapeutics. It, there's a lot more to come. So we, we need to pace ourselves and, and continue working with, with this um, collaboration amongst all of us. Thank you, well said, Michelle. And uh, Pablo, after 18 months, we're not only older, uh, I think we're wiser. How are we wiser? Oh, oh we are in, in a world that seems, or that seemed divided in 2020, I think that the greatest lesson learned is that great collaboration and 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 with the partners and planning can be done. When, when, when you just can go as one, it's impressive what we can do. Uh, to be honest with you, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, we're not always optimistic, right? And I'm talking personally here. Uh, it was dire times and, and seeing this great outcome in, in the little role that we played for, for all humanity, it, it was impressive. So for me, that's the, the greatest lessons learned. And um, as, as you know, we serve Latin America. So this type of cargo is not decreasing at all. Uh, it has already become part of a, our daily routine. Uh, it's been working great and we expect. Thank you, Pablo. And finally, Tishan Paul. Yeah, I, I think the, you know, the, the lesson forward. learned so the lesson learned for me is, um, you know, how, how resilient our industry is, right? And, and, and when presented with a common challenge, how collaboration can fuel efficiencies quicker than probably any of us thought possible. Um, and I think if we can take that lesson learned and apply it not just to vaccine handling, but to general cargo and, 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 and some of the challenges we face every day, um, you know, we can eliminate some of these processes that are, that are dated that create bottlenecks that affect everyone in the logistics supply chain um, and will eventually result in a better product for every stakeholder and for the end user, the, the consumer. So uh, I, th I think that's the number one lesson learned and, and hopefully it's something that, uh, that we continue working towards. Um, and then again, like, like Paul said, continue to apply the pressure. Excellent, thank you, Sean Paul. Uh, from what you all uh, echoed, uh, we are definitely better prepared uh, for the next year or so with vaccine distribution uh, from all the lessons we learned uh, over the past. So uh, I wanna thank you all, uh, all our panelists for your candid discussions and for sharing your invaluable experiences with us all. Uh, to wrap up the discussion, I took some notes as you were all speaking and I wanted to offer some takeaways I have from what I heard from you all. Uh, and so here are, are some of them. Uh, collaboration and communication uh, during this pandemic are uh, key 
uh, it's a new reality and we, we must collaborate and we must communicate in order for us all to succeed as partners. Uh, also, uh, you can plan as much as possible, but the reality does not always match expectations. So we must be flexible and be ready for contingencies uh, in, within our operations. Uh, another takeaway I have, uh, the good that we do for our clients and our customers also translates to good businesses, to, to good business. And I'm thinking of you all that are on the panel discussion right now. Uh, I am confident that with all the good uh, deeds and all the hard work that you all have done over the past 18 months, Envirotainer, DHL Aero, Expresso, Cunin Nago, Latam Cargo, and WFS uh, will bring value to your companies for many years to come uh, based on what we've all done over the past uh, year or so. Uh, and finally, about the air cargo industry and vaccine distribution during the pandemic, and I'm going to uh, um, use some of the comments that, that I heard from you all earlier. Uh, I think through the pandemic, the air cargo industry has definitely proven to be resilient uh, and the industry has risen to the challenge and we will continue to do so in the future. We are better prepared uh, to deal with the vaccine distribution based on all of our experiences over the past 18 months. So thank you once again to all our panelists and thank you again to EVA International Media for hosting this important panel discussion. Thank you all. Well, what a what an excellent panel. And Jimmy, I've got to say thank you so, so much for a very professional job. It was just like watching watching something on the television there, the way you navigated around all the all the guests and spread the questions out. Fantastic. Um, what I'd like to say, Pablo, Michelle, Sean Paul, uh, Christina, and Don, it's so nice to see people who are so open, transparent, and who genuinely care about the industry and the business that we're in. And that's why supply chain and also cargo specifically has gained the recognition globally that it has uh, long deserved. So I'd just like to say again, thank you so, so much. Well done to you and your respective teams. And um, thank you for joining us, giving up your valuable time and for you know giving people a reflection of your experiences and also the positives moving forward. And there are so, so many. And I think, Michelle, you said it's exciting. I'm not sure if it was yourself who said it was exciting or, or whether it was Christina, but my goodness me, it is, and there's so much more everybody can learn and benefit from, and provided we collaborate, share data, and be as transparent as possible, the world will be a much better place as a result. Lastly, Jimmy, excellent show, my friends. Made my time very easy, and you're more than welcome anytime. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Thank you for the kind words. Appreciate it.